Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out today. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this. It's my favorite subject, uh, as you might imagine. Um, and, and also, I'm really excited about uh, uh, speaking here. This is the first time I've ever like, officially given a talk at a pub. Um, I suppose there's been unofficial times. Um, <coughs> <laughs> so, uh, I want to try to tell you the difference between genetic engineering and synthetic biology. Uh, and, and if that's the main thing that we uh, begin to talk about when the Q&A starts, um, then I hopefully will have succeeded. So, my first slide here is about genetic engineering, which is amazing enough in and of itself. So, just to give you some examples. Uh, in the upper right here, uh, uh, David Schaefer's lab has figured out how to uh, take viruses evolve them into place so that they can deliver genes to cells in a retina. Those genes restore function that was lost or never was there due to uh, an inherited disease, and these eyes work again. So that's amazing in and of itself. Uh, these are neurons uh, in a mouse uh, that have been genetically engineered. The mouse is genetically engineered. It grows up with all this stuff already in there so that those neurons um, can emit a, a light signal when they fire so you can watch them and you can even send a light signal to them so that they fire and you can control them. And Ed Boyden's research here at MIT is to uh, uh, make uh, implants into the mouse so that you can actually uh, control and, and look at neurons and, and actually control and look at what the mouse is doing. And this is a genetically engineered mouse uh, that is able to do this, right? Your brain won't work this way until you get the update, and then maybe it will. Um, this is uh, uh, a sort of a personalized medicine uh, picture. So the idea here is, an, and this is in trials, that you can take the immune system cells out of a patient that has cancer, um, look at their specific cancer, and they're all different, uh, program, reprogram those immune system cells by inserting something that allows them to recognize cancer cells, stick them back in the patient, and those cancer cell or those immune system cells will begin to find the cancer cells and do their business. Um, and uh, this is in the New York Times last week. Can anybody see that article about the oranges in the New York Times? So I love this article because it brings up all of these issues about um, whether or not we should do genetic engineering. Basically, the gist of the article is we either genetically engineer the orange or you're all going to be drinking apple juice. <coughs> um, and that's because there's a scourge, it's a, it's a bacterium that's spread by a bug uh, that makes it so the oranges don't grow right. Um, and it's pretty much all over the planet at this point. Uh, these guys want to take a gene from spinach that uh, may or may not, but this is this research, um, uh, allow the oranges to protect themselves against this scourge uh, and thereby give you orange juice instead of apple juice, or at least the option to have orange juice, which you may not have if they didn't do this. So that kind of brings up, you know, a pretty dire issue, right? Those are the kinds of things that people are doing in genetic engineering, from crops to uh, fixing uh, diseases to allowing you to probe brains at a level that you couldn't do before. Um, but for the most part, if you were to replace a gene with another gene from another organism or a few genes in an organism, that's like going into a house and replacing a light bulb with a new light bulb and saying you made a new house. That's not really uh, uh, programming, right? That's, that's poking. So how many people are programmers in the audience, people who write code for a living or like to write code? So this is my, whoops, it didn't go forward. This is my Atari 800 computer from when I was a kid. And my favorite thing to do back then was to poke numbers into arbitrary locations and see what they did. Uh, everybody did this if they had an Atari 800, it was super fun. So you could make your screen turn orange and like shift everything over. And so like here's a little program that actually makes it so that you don't stare at too much blue light so you could fall asleep at night because it turns it orange, right? I didn't really write a program, right? I just poked in there. And later I learned how to program. And that's what we're learning in, in genetic engineering right now is how to, instead of just go in and, and tweak something in the, in the genome, to actually wholesale rewrite it. Um, the advances in genetic engineering are staggering at this point. So, you know, since the late 20s, we've been able to tweak DNA. They didn't even know what, what they were doing at that point um, and mutate things. In the early 70s, uh, people discovered how to take DNA, stitch it together, make new pieces of DNA, and transform uh, organisms with it so that they took up that DNA. Um, at this point, we're rewriting entire uh, bacterial cells and yeast cells. I'll talk about that in a second. And, and, and really, the amount of DNA that we can make and insert reliably into organisms uh, is, is, uh, is just going through an exponential growth phase. And in fact, um, you can just go to a website. So this is DNA 2.0's website. 
Uh, and you can enter in the sequence that you want. You can enter in the sequence for your credit card. You click OK, and the DNA comes in the mail in a little tube. And if you know what you're doing, you can then use that to uh, you know, stick into a cell and make it do something new. Um, uh, and that is the subject of genetic engineering and synthetic biology. So it's really come a remarkably far uh, distance from um, stitching together little bits of DNA to really wholesale rewrites um, of genetic code. This is a, 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 a plot in a log scale, uh, which says this is 10 times less than that one, right, um, uh, over the years of how much it costs to, um, uh, to build uh, DNA and to build genes and how much DNA people are making in bases per person per day in various labs around the world. And if you extrapolate this down, then by somewhere around 2020, you could make a whole synthetic bacterial genome for like 350 bucks. And you could make an entire human genome for something like the price of a house. Right? That's how much DNA you could make. So those are the kinds of issues that, that are coming up and people are programming with this stuff and playing with it and trying to figure out what to do. Um, as an example, so last week I was at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, which is like the birthplace of genetics, and there's this amazing talk by uh, a guy at Johns Hopkins, Jeff Bokey, who is um, making yeast 2.0. So if you're having a beer, it was made with some yeast, that's the same kind of yeast, and it's the basis for all sorts of different genetic engineering and processes that we want to be able to tweak yeast to make a new molecule or whatever, or study how living systems work. It's genome is actually really inconvenient compared to, say, a Linux operating system, which is really convenient, right? Linux, you can say, I want a new kernel, I s a module, I stick it in the kernel, don't even have to shut down the computer, and it goes. Yeast is it's relatively difficult to work with. These guys are taking chromosome by chromosome, there's 16 chromosomes in yeast, and they are rewriting them to insert all sorts of really convenient little pieces of DNA that allow you to do things and manipulate that genome with unprecedented accuracy. <coughs> and pretty soon, uh, they've got 12 million bases. Um, they're about halfway done. They'll have an entirely new strain of yeast that is completely synthetic that has all sorts of manipulability built into it. Um, 20 million base, uh, 12 million bases is about 200 times smaller than the human genome for reference, right? And this is basically taking them a few years. And if you extrapolate this forward, they're going to do this to everything. They're do this to corn, to make corn easier to engineer. They probably already have done a lot of that to corn, for example. OK, so synthetic biology is about programming. So it's not about necessarily just poking little bits of DNA, stitching together things from spinach and whatever. It's about making entire programs, entire networks. So this is an example from a guy named Kobe Benenson at ETH that I really like. What he's done is made a combinatorial cancer detector. Combinatorial means it takes a combination, to some extent, of different molecules, those are shown up here, uh, the little squiggly lines, um, that are present only in a cancer cell. So if these two molecules and that one, or these two molecules and that one, some, some logical combination of molecules are present in the cell, this network of genes, and these things come from a variety of different organisms that he's taken and stitched together into a regulatory network that computes whether that combination is present in the cell. And in this case, it just makes some red protein. But you can imagine that the next thing that it would do is actually make something that would cause the cell to die. So you could transfect this into a human, and then you would uh, uh, program it to recognize the cells. And it's that kind of programming that synthetic biology is, as opposed to uh, inserting genes and hoping that you take the functionality of spinach and put it into an orange. <coughs> um, so in our lab, this is something you can play with. Uh, my 12-year-old son over there, Dylan, uh, I came home one day and he was playing with this. So you can just download it off our web page. It's a programming language. And it looks a lot like programming languages that you would program web pages in, as opposed to you know crazy ATCs and Gs. Our idea, and it's something that we're still getting to work, I'll show you an example, is that you take a programming language that looks like this, that you can imagine writing uh, uh, programs in, uh, for lots of other things in this kind of language, and somehow compile it down into a sequence of ATCs and Gs, that then you send a DNA 2.0, and they send you tons and tons of test tubes. The test tubes have uh, the DNA in there. You reconstitute it, you transform it into your cells, and you get some crazy behavior, and hopefully it matches what the program said you were supposed to do. Um, and usually it doesn't, <laughs> and that's why it's research. <laughs> and so we take that and we re, uh, rework the program, we rework the compiler, and we try again. And we sit around going around in circles until out pops a paper, and uh, 
And that's the process in my lab. So, <laughs> okay, so some people are uh, identifying with that. Um, so this is my group of students. Um, I just wanted to show you that all of the, the, uh, all the faces that are in my lab, we work on all sorts of things. What I'm really interested in primarily is not so much building the next cancer detector cell, although I think it would be amazing, is really building tools that vertically integrate all of the different things that go into genetic engineering new cells and reprogramming them. So you need to have people that know how to do the experiments, how to characterize parts, how to do process control and automation to reduce the variability in all of the processes that we use to make these cells. You need design tools like I was showing you. You need architectures to take, to compile the designs down into something that's actually going to work. And then you need to apply them to different applications. We're really trying to do that vertical engineering thing from the bottom all the way up. Right? which makes it harder, but I think ultimately, uh, and there's a community of people that are all doing this. Some people are more focused on this part, some people are more focused on that part, but that's what synthetic biology is, is trying to get this into some kind of engineering process that you would see for an automobile or an airplane or a new TV set. Um, so here's an example from our lab. We're kind of excited about this one. So I just to give you a flavor of the stuff that we know how to do, um, something that popped out of that process, um, and it's called consolidated bioprocessing. So, uh, Cellulose is something you could get from plant feedstock, right? So it's a very complicated big molecule over here. There's an N here, which means that it goes on and on and on. It makes these huge wads of molecules. The molecules are so big that if you wanted to make a bacterium that could eat those molecules, they're too big to get inside the cell. So you need to digest them. So there's a paper out of uh, Berkeley uh, from the Kiesling lab, and what they did was they, m they took some enzymes. You can get them from termite saliva, various different places. Um, and you, uh, you take these enzymes and, they, um, and you export them outside of the cell. And outside of the cell, they do their business and digest this stuff into a simple sugar. The problem is cells like bacteria don't really like to export that many molecules. They usually just export a little. And so what we figured was what we could do is take the kinds of ideas that we're doing and engineer a better system. So the way our system works is that we have two kinds of cells, um, but they're derived from a single type of cell. Uh, and so there's a program differentiation process that makes these altruist, uh, these producer cells, which are growing on the simple sugar and produce high value chemicals, occasionally they just stochastically differentiate into a new type of cell, same genetic material, but new state, uh, and they become altruistic, in which case they make a bunch of these little enzymes and then they pop themselves. They're like little suicide bombers. They sacrifice themselves for the good of the colony. Um, those enzymes go out, break down the cellulose, make the simple sugar, and the process goes around. A little positive feedback loop. So this is something that we know how to do. Um, let's see, there's, a, there's a, a circuit. I know this is being recorded. I don't want to put too much on here because my postdoc will be really mad. Uh, I told everybody how that works and he hasn't published this yet. But basically, <laughs> the idea is, is that there's a, a bunch of genes that do the, the import of the simple sugar and the digestion. Um, there's a switch. So this thing uh, turns off that side and this thing turns off that side. So it's like a toggle switch, like a light switch. And you're either a producer until you stochastically switch into a consumer. When you switch into a consumer, you make the enzyme, which is a cellulase, and a gene that makes it so that you occasionally you eventually pop yourself. Here's a video. This is a super awesome video. So what you're going to see is the producers are red. So we engineered them to, to make also red fluorescent protein, which you can get from a modified uh, jellyfish protein, and green fluorescent protein, also from a jellyfish. Pretty cool. And you stick that, you make, uh, so the altruists will be green, the producers will be red. And you can't, th this is a, a phase contrast microscope image. And this will be the two fluorescence channels overlaid on top of each other. So you'll be able to see the green and the red. Um, and what you'll see is occasionally, you'll see this front up here where the green cells have switched their states. They've become altruists and eventually and they're going to get really long and weird looking and then they're going to pop. And you'll see the actual GFP, pop, you can't see the enzyme because it's invisible um, to the microscope, but you can see the GFP, the green stuff, as it, as it comes out of the cell and then diffuses away. And so that's sort of a stand in for being able to see the enzyme. So the, the movie runs a few times. So if you look down in the bottom right, this, these cells are the ultra cells. This one pops uh, and then it goes again. 
So uh, Rob Egbert, who's the postdoc who did this stuff, sat there watching this, making movies and movies and movies. You can see him popping over here, but none as dramatic as that. And it's really hard to get that to work. We actually had to make libraries of, of huge numbers of libraries of versions of this. Can you still hear me? Did I mess it up? OK. Um, and, and screen uh, uh, for a variant that actually did this. Most of the time, you either you make too many altruists, and then they all die, or you don't make enough altruists, and you have no food to eat. So getting it just right was good. Um, it's actually an interesting thing. So one of the things that people ask about is, if you were to release this in the environment, is that a good idea? Um, wouldn't they just start evolving and taking over? So this one actually has an interesting built-in property. <coughs> if the system begins to evolve, which way is it going to evolve? Well, we don't really know, but we have good guesses. One of the ways it'll evolve is for cells to stop popping. I mean, what a stupid idea. Then your whole genetic line just stops if you pop, right? So if you stop popping, that's great for you. It's a real, there's a lot of pressure to go in that way. And we actually see that in the lab. They stop popping, the whole system crashes. The system goes long enough to digest a bunch of cellulose, and we have plots and graphs showing that, and then eventually evolves into a situation where they don't pop anymore, and the whole system crashes. There's actually kind of a built-in safety mechanism we're calling it a feature, even though <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, the people who would probably use this to build, you know, do biofuel processes and things like that would um, want this thing to go on longer. So we actually have ways we think we can get around it as well. Um, this circuit is actually pretty simple. So there's, there's, there's two genes that repress each other and then another set of genes that is, is inhibited by one of those states so that you don't pop. Um, but the basic idea of taking a single cell and differentiating it so that you've got different you know, uh, processes happening in each one, it's basically what the process of development is, which is the kind of process that we want to be able to engineer. So another uh, group of students in my lab are working on uh, a way to make a sort of general purpose computer, a CPU, out of interacting gene networks, these genes are off and these genes turn on, you get a signal and, and so forth, you can actually make some kind of computational device, we think, and this is a design for a, a relatively complicated one um, that we haven't built yet, but, but the design pops out when you do the compilation that we were talking about. And our hypothesis is that this kind of computer is at the heart of every multi-celled organism. It controls when you switch into one state, which other states you switch into, what you do in each state, how you communicate with the other cells, and so on, so that you get uh, a robust behavior out of the system. And it's actually these kinds of systems that break uh, when there's cancer and things like that going on in the system, they don't obey the program um, because they're perturbed or tweaked or mutated in some way. And so understanding these kinds of programs, learning how to build them from the bottom up so that we can reprogram to do different kinds of differentiation processes is sort of what my lab is all about. And that last example is one of those. Um, so like I said, I'm an engineer, and I'm really interested in this process. So this is my sort of traditional view of a scientist, right? So he's at his lab, he's, he's working, he's trying to figure stuff out, he's doing his own pipetting, he doesn't have a pipetting robot to do it for him, um, there's stuff all over the place. But if we're going to engineer living systems, these things are going to be as complicated as anything that humanity has ever engineered. Furthermore, we're going to take them and put them into ecosystems, which are even more complicated, and we're trying to understand them. And the engineering paradigm for how you do that is still being written. We don't really know. So just as a few examples, for example, if Boeing built airplanes the way, or released, rolled out new airplanes the way that Microsoft rolled out new operating systems, no one would, would want to get on a plane, right? <coughs> um, and, and actually, there's, you might say they're actually sort of doing that already with Boeing, but um, <laughs> really, it's a very safe airplane. And, and I think... <laughs> This is a talk about synthetic biology, not airplanes, okay. Um, but you know, you, you know there's a difference, right? So these guys, you know, get your alpha testers, your beta testers, you release it in the world. Um, you know, this is the Cassini space probe, and they, they launched that thing. It went all the way out in the outer space and started taking pictures, and it totally worked the first time, and it's a one-of-a-kind thing. It's a totally different process to make a, a machine like that than it is to make a machine like this. It just has to work. That's probably the kind of engineering that we have to do with living organisms that we're sticking in people's bodies and into the environment. And the, the, this book is being written. You know, 
by the way, just so you know, there, um, there's an open source movement. So, you know, if you buy your corn from Monsanto, you might not really know what the DNA is in there. Wouldn't you rather know? So um, all the code that we write is going to be open sourced and put online. And we're going to try to let people, you know, use it and, and change it just like you would with software. We think that's really important. Um, this is a sort of freaky thing. There's Kickstarter projects in synthetic biology. <laughs> so you can go and say, this guy wants to make a unicorn or whatever. And <laughs> Uh, you can fund that if you want to. I'm not sure that that's exactly the way that I would want to be want genetic engineering to go. So these are some interesting talking points. Um, there's also, of course, uh, probably coming down the pipeline, a whole industry of people trying to figure out ways to screw up living systems and the Norton antivirus patch for uh, how you would fix that. So um, there's a lot of issues in the engineering of these systems that I'm fascinated and I love to talk about. Um, and I'll just end here with a few issues that I think are sort of conversation starters. Um, I see Stephanie's over there. <laughs> um, <coughs> so have I done 20 minutes more or less or should I? I'm good. Okay. So uh, I'd love to talk about the science. So if you have questions about, you know, how does that really work? I don't understand what, what this DNA business is and, and what, it, uh, what it does. Um, if you'd like to talk about the engineering, like how did you get that thing to switch back and forth at just the right frequency? Um, I'd love that. There's benefits and risks. So this is like a total, like, so my wife, Lori, was quizzing me this morning. She said, what if somebody asks you about GMOs? What are you going to say? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll do my best, right? Okay. Um, uh, there's ethics. Like should we really reprogram life? And I think there's some interesting questions to ask there. Um, there's policy. So what kinds of things should our government and our companies, uh, what should they be talking about? And then there's awareness and understanding. If you don't know about these issues, uh, y you know, we won't be able to inform how our government, how our uh, the other governments of the world and how companies are doing this stuff and they'll just steamroller us and do whatever we want. So I think that the, the best thing to do is to learn about how to do this. Go to DNA 2.0, order some of your own DNA, see what happens, um, build something, uh, <laughs> maybe collaborate with a scientist to do it. Uh, you can so far do it in your garage. I'm not advocating that, but you can. Um, so figure out these things and be you know, ready uh, because it's coming. So that's my talk. Thank you.